When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always is a man whose backbeat is as big as Liberty DeVito's. He is the captain. I got dumps like a truck, 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 thighs like I, what? I said, I said backbeat, not backside. Well, it's good to <laughs> see and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Tonight we are drinking Project Dank by Lacumbre Brewing Company Garage Grade 4 and a quarter bottle caps. Project Dank is just that, a project. Each recipe features different hops and techniques. Today we are drinking the summer edition thanks to our good friends. More specifically, let's say hi to Lindsay and Regina Saskatchewan. And a big shout out to Jennifer in Madisonville, Louisiana. Off to the great state of Georgia, and here's a long-distance cheers to Tiffany Marie in Chatsworth and Amanda in Dawsonville. And a big shout-out to Depop and Kern and Parts Unknown. And last but not least, here's a high-five to our friend Jason from West Haven, Connecticut. Thanks, everybody, for helping out with this week's beer run. If you want to help us up and fill up the fridge for next week's show, go to TrueCrimeGarage.com and click on the Donate button. Yeah, all the cool kids are doing it. All your friends are donating, so... You should too. And that's enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. The Baranigans were not rich, but they certainly were comfortable and happy. Richard Brannigan's job as a sales representative for a cement company based out of New Jersey provided well for his family. They were able to buy a house in an exclusive section of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. The house on Pine Top Trail was in a secluded wooded area. The driveway allowed for privacy. The house came with all the benefits of suburban life in the 1970s. Quality schools, quality friends, and the safety of a well-to-do group of neighbors. The Brannigan family was a typical 1960s family. Peg and Richard had two children, Sean and his little sister Holly, and Peg was a stay-at-home mom. But life can change on a dime, and it did for the Brannigans when Peg was diagnosed with leukemia. She fought hard, but ended up losing her battle in November of 1976. Throughout her illness, the family dynamic changed. At 14, Holly started to take over the role of the homemaker. She did her best to keep the family unit moving through everyday life as her mother slipped away. This role she assumed without complaint, and the three of them 
had to pull together to keep moving forward. Three years after Peg passed, the children had grown. It was 1979. Sean was a freshman at Lehigh University, while Holly was a junior at Freedom High School. Sean was interested in cars, and he worked at Renner's Service Station in Hanover Township. This was a mobile gas station that also serviced vehicles. Holly grew into a respectful, quiet teen. She was an average student and sang alto in the senior choir at school. She was also the manager of the boys' school soccer team. Holly did work a summer job at the local Holiday Inn as a server, but had recently left the job for part-time work at the mall. Her plans after high school were to attend Penn State University. With their dad traveling most of the week for work, the Brannigan children became very independent. They didn't have the typical parental supervision. Holly and Sean both lived their own lives. They looked out for each other, but each had their own group of friends and habits. This never was an issue until March 28th. 1979. On Wednesday, March 28, 1979, 17 year old Holly Brannigan attended school, and took the bus home as usual. She entered her house and proceeded on with her day just like any other. This meant calling her friends and talking on the phone at length. That day at school, Holly had made plans with friends to go out for pizza. She was going to be picked up at her house at 6 p.m. Holly was on the phone in her bedroom with one of her friends when at 4.40 p.m. she told her friend that someone was at the door. Holly placed the phone on her bed and went to answer the door. The friend would wait a few minutes, listening to the radio playing in the background. A couple of minutes later, Holly picked up the phone in the kitchen and informed her friend that someone was there and she would have to end the call. At 4.45 p.m., Holly called her father's office and asked his secretary, B, if her father had already left for his business trip. B told her he had indeed left the office and was on his way to Atlantic City. At 5 p.m., Holly's friend calls her back. Side note here, there, there are two versions of this, and it may be important we can evaluate that later, but some reports state that the phone rang, but no one answered the phone. Mm-hmm. Other reports say that the friend heard a busy signal. At 6 p.m., one of Holly's other friends, this is her friend Sally, arrives to pick her up to go for pizza. The friend knocks on the front door and is greeted by the family dog. The dog's name is Clancy, and the dog, of course, is barking because somebody's knocking on the door. Her friend knocks again, but once again, nobody answers. The friend assumes Holly is either in the shower running late for their plans, or maybe she has changed her plans and was already out of the house. So her friend decides to walk around to the side of the house to a staircase that leads to the kitchen sliding glass door. She stops at the base of the stairs when she, quote, had a bad feeling, end quote. Her feeling caused her not to ascend the stairs. At the same time, as Holly was home after school, Sean, her brother, was at his friend's house. His friend's name is Mark Viola. Yeah, Mark was 18 and Mark lived with his parents at the time. When Mark's mother made dinner that night, she asked Sean if he would like to stay for dinner. And this was an offer that that happened regularly and Mm -hmm. Sean never turned down this offer. You know, you know how it goes when you're at a buddy's house and you're a teenager, 18, 19, and his mom's cooking dinner, you stick around, right? You stick around for a couple hours. Well, and his, his mom just passed away also. And so then, you know, I grew up living with my father. So if anybody offered me food, I took it because you didn't have the mom at home cooking the good meal. The weird thing here, Captain, is not only has his mother passed away, but on this night, his father would be out of town traveling for work, 
which was not an uncommon occurrence. Mm -hmm. And then he has his younger sister who's at home. But the vibe that I get from this situation is it wouldn't be terribly uncommon for Holly, even being a minor, to stay home by herself. Yeah, but I think once you get into you know, late middle school, high school, it's pretty common that you're left home alone. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the two young men, uh, Holly's brother, Sean and his friend, Mark at Mark's house, they were working on a vehicle. And even after dinner, they decided, Hey, look, things are going good on this project. Let's just stay and finish up this project. So let's after dinner, let's get back to working on the car. Now, Sean knew that this would run very late into the night and he would probably be spending the night at Mark's home. Yeah, so he's going to call home to tell his sister that he's spending the night at his buddy's house. He's going to get the busy signal, though. He won't actually speak with Holly, and from my understanding, he tries to call several times that night to let her know. But keep in mind, his sister that he's trying to reach, she's a junior in high school, and one thing we do know about her typical day is that she spent the evenings on the phone. Right. So calling home, getting the busy signal, it's not going to set off any red flags for Sean because he's at his friend's house. He's calling home, trying to reach his sister. One could assume that she would be on the phone that night, just going about her normal business. Well, the following day, the next morning on March 29th, one of Holly's friends arrives at the house to pick her up for school. The friend knocks on the door, but the only answer she gets is the dog. Her friend knocks again and leaves for school without any contact from Holly. Now, her brother Sean arrived home in the morning and found Holly's lifeless body lying on the kitchen floor near the sliding glass door. She was lying in a dried pool of blood with a blade of a 10-inch kitchen knife sticking out of her right side of her back. The handle to the murder weapon was lying on the floor near Holly. The handle had snapped and broke off. Sean sees the kitchen phone is off the hook and a clock is broken and on the floor. The hands of the clock had stopped and remained at 520. Sean leaves the house and calls the police and then calls his father's office. The office calls Richard and he returns home immediately. The police arrive and they start to process the scene. This police force, unfortunately, has very little experience in murder investigations. They fail to tape off the house in the yard. Instead of limiting access to the scene, they let several people enter and leave the house. They do process the scene as best as they know how. They collected fingerprints and took many photographs. The handle to the knife was collected. On further examination, it was determined that the handle had been wiped clean. It contained no prints. There was talk of a bloody towel being recovered from the scene, but no evidence of that exists to this day. There was no sign of anything missing from the house. Holly's body was taken to the corner, and it was determined that she had 18 wounds, mostly to the back. Out of the 18 wounds, 15 would have been fatal stab wounds. Three were less serious wounds, and Holly had a couple of defensive wounds on her hands. So let's talk about what that could mean here, Captain. We see that we have 18 wounds. 15 of them were fatal stab wounds. That's a serious... That means any one of these 15 stab wounds would have killed her. Mm -hmm. And we talked about the weapon being a 10-inch kitchen knife. So this is something that most likely might have been grabbed in the heat of the moment. And she's stabbed repeatedly. Well, wouldn't we know this? I mean, wouldn't we know if the knife came from inside the house or if it came from outside the house? Yes, it came from the Brannigan's home. It it belonged to the Brannigan's. And so we have this situation here where most of the wounds are to her back. She had very few defensive wounds. There's a chance that whoever decided to attack her and for whatever reason waited until her back was turned and Mm -hmm. then they went after her and she would have died very quickly during this attack. And then she's left on the floor. Let's just go over this a a little bit more. So she's on the phone with one of her friends Mm -hmm. and she puts down the phone, says, Hey, there's somebody at the door. So she puts the phone down. Right. So we don't know if, 
her friend on the phone if she heard dog barking or not, right? Right. Her friend heard a radio. So when when Holly put the phone down, the radio was playing either in the house or inside Holly's room. At that time, she was on the phone in her room. Right. Okay, so when she put the phone down, her friend could hear the music that was playing on the radio. So she couldn't in the hear background. Any, right. Couldn't she never. Else. I couldn't find any reports of her saying that she heard the dog barking. Um, looking at the layout of the house, there could have been a decent amount of distance between Holly's room and the front door. Yeah. And so with the radio being on, even. You know, I have a couple dogs and they bark regardless. They bark whether it's somebody they know or somebody they don't know if somebody knocks on the door. Mm -hmm. So given the distance between her room and the front door and the added fact that the radio's on, that could have drowned out the noise of the dog. I would assume the dog was barking at that time. So then she goes and answers the door. Holly goes and answers the door. Correct. She then gets back on the phone in the kitchen. Not immediately. Not immediately. Yes. Some time passes, a few minutes. We'll Several say. minutes pass, and then she it's believed that she picked up the phone in the kitchen and says to her friend, hey, um, somebody's here. I'll have to call you back. It almost seems like Holly doesn't know this individual because if it was somebody that was common to her and her friend, she would say, hey, you know, Jake is here. Well, you know? that's that's the tricky thing. And... Uh, that is what the investigators were hoping to find out. Now, the weird thing here, though, is think about that sequence of events. So she puts down the phone, goes and answers the door, and her friend remains on the phone for several minutes before Holly returns to the phone, regardless if it's the phone in her bedroom or in the kitchen, regardless of what phone. Several minutes pass right. before Holly then says, hey, I'm going to have to call you back. Somebody's here. What that tells me is two things. When she answered the door, she can, can we can we agree that there's a chance if it was somebody she didn't know, she might not answer the door. I'm not saying it's 100%, but there could be a small chance that hey, I don't recognize this person. I'm home alone. I'm just not going to answer the door. Right. That's a possibility. That's a possibility. So, I think that that leans to the point of either she knew the person or at least the person seemed to be non-threatening. There was no obvious signs of a threat. She right. willingly opens up the door, engages in some kind of conversation with this individual to the point of this person may have been unexpected. I think if it was somebody that was either expected or somebody that she knew very well, she might know immediately, hey, I'm going to talk to this person or welcome them in and then tell her friend almost immediately, hey, so-and-so's here, I'm going to have to call you back. Right. But what happens instead is several minutes pass. It's almost like when she answered the door and saw this person and then engaged in conversation with them, she did not know from the get-go that this was going to turn into a longer conversation, a yeah. longer visit than expected. And then, so there's two things. One, she doesn't know this individual, so that's why she's telling her friend, someone, quote-unquote, someone. Mm-hmm. Or she knows this individual, it's uh, maybe a guy that she's seeing on the side and that she's not telling her friends about because that happens. Mm -hmm. And so when she goes to tell her friend, hey, uh, I mean, she could have been sitting there at the door flirting with this guy. We don't know. And she gets back on the phone and tells her friend, uh, somebody's here because mm -hmm. I can't tell you who is here. So either or, in my mind, the tricky thing becomes then she hangs up the phone and she calls her father's work mm -hmm. to find out if he's left on his trip yet. Right. So one, it could be junior in high school has a guy come over, wants to make sure her father left, you know, on his trip. Mm -hmm. And so we can sit here and hang out, have the house to ourselves. Worst case scenario, my brother comes home, but that's not a big deal. Right. Right. Or, it's, I want to see if my father left because this guy's asking about my father. Or I need to speak to my father for some reason. I lean towards yeah. the point, towards the side of she was looking to speak with her father. With knowing how often he traveled for work, I think that it wouldn't be tough for her to put together plans. If she had plans of hanging out and doing things maybe that her father wouldn't approve of, 
I don't think it would have been very hard in a single parent home with a, with a father that's traveling often for work. Right. So more to me, I feel like this is almost like uh, she needed to get a hold of her father for some reason. And this reason was unexpected. Mm-hmm. Whatever came up, came up. It just came up and she's trying to get a hold of her father, you know, back in the day, well before cell phones, you have to call the office to try to get a hold of dad. Well, here's where it gets a little more tricky because did this individual know her father and say, Hey, um, I'm here to see your father. Mm -hmm. So she calls and says, Hey, I'm going to, Hey, has my dad left yet? You know, she might not have went into details of, cause there's somebody at the house to see him. Mm -hmm. Or did this person not know her father? And it was just a ruse to get into the house. Right. You know what I mean? Like, Hey, I'm here to see your father because if I use that as a ruse, well, my father's not here. Mm-hmm. See what I mean? Like, um, it's kind of like if somebody asks you, is your parents home? You're always supposed to say yes. If they called on the phone back in the eighties, that was the thing Like people would call and be like, are your parents at home? Right. And you're supposed to say yes, even if they're not like, but they're in the shower or whatever. Right. So, but what a great ruse to get inside the house, you know, Hey, I'm here to see your father. Right. Oh, uh, well, he's not here. Well, where is he at? And that, to me, that makes a little bit of sense because, like you said, she would know her father's travel arrangements a little bit since he's traveling so much Mm -hmm. and he's traveling on a school night, right? But it seems like she almost called the office to say, hey, is he available to talk or is he coming back? Mm -hmm. So again, but that's where it becomes tricky because was it just a ruse to get in the house or or did this individual actually know her father? But then you have to question, why does the individual want to be in the house in the first place? Regardless of if they use a ruse or if or if it was known to Holly who this person was. Right. Because we have the coroner who would later determine that there was no signs of sexual assault. They also claim that there might have been some material under her fingernails, so her nails were clipped and preserved. Mm. I question if that had anything to do with the actual crime itself. With seeing so many of the wounds to her back and very few what we would call defensive wounds, I almost wonder if there was really no defense put up at all. Well, it seems like this perpetrator did not bring a weapon with them. Right. Gets in the house at some point grabs a knife, starts stabbing her Why she's back facing him. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, like you said, it's so vicious. I mean, 15 stab wounds that are fatal. I mean, that seems um, like there's some rage. Yes, this is a strong, angry person that did this. This is a strong, angry person. So, yeah, keep that in mind. That's what I think we're dealing with here. I think we're dealing with somebody that, that might have been welcomed into the home for some reason that showed up to the house with didn't intend to kill her because they, or maybe they did. Well, they, they could have, but not bringing a murder weapon to a murder scene usually suggests that they weren't planning to kill the individual. But if you knew this family pretty well and that you knew that she's going to be home alone, uh, father's going to be out on a trip. Mm -hmm. All I have to do is get into the house and get to the kitchen. Again, no signs of sexual assault, and the thought is that nothing had been stolen from the house. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot. And it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. 
Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. At Consumer Cellular, you get the same exact coverage as the largest carriers, but for up to half the cost. Same thing, up to half the cost. Up to half the cost for the same thing. 50% the money for 100% the same thing. I hope I'm making myself clear. Consumer Cellular. When freedom calls, we're here to answer. Call us at 1-888-FREEDOM. Half the cost savings based on cost of Consumer Cellular single-line 5 gigabyte data plan with unlimited talk and text compared to lowest cost single-line postpaid unlimited talk text and data plan offered by T-Mobile and Verizon May 2023. All right. Cheers, me mateys. Cheers, Captain. All right. So I have a couple questions. So at 440... She's talking to her friend. She tells the friend, hey, somebody's at my door. Mm -hmm. At 445, according to the secretary, Holly then calls her father's work to see if he's left yet on the business trip. Then we have this broken clock at 520. Correct. So maybe their clock is a little off. Some people's clocks are a little off in their house. But let's assume that is correct. Or, Or even roughly correct. If it's within a few minutes... It's still helpful. Right. So we can assume that the attack probably happened around that point. Correct. So talking with somebody last week about this case, I did throw this out there, and I know it's not a very high probability, but I did throw this out there just from my own personal experience. I told him, I said, you know, uh, at any given point in my life, it's very likely that I had one broken clock hanging on a wall somewhere in my house. I just do like they quit running. I never look at them for actual time and they're more there for decoration. The battery goes out at some point and it stops running until I change it months and months and months later. Correct. So that we're not ignoring that as a very small, slight possibility that it was just a clock that happened not to work, that it's said 520 all the time. Right. Um, that, yeah, but that, but the likelihood seems very incredibly slim because here's the deal. I think what we can assume here is that with her being found dead inside the home, yeah, I think we can assume that she's already dead by 6 PM because of the friend coming to visit. I, I think that there's no evidence to suggest anything otherwise, right? We have, we have her on the phone. We know she's alive at approximately four forty PM. Mm-hmm. If the secretary's timing is right. And I, I tend to believe secretaries when they give quotes on time. Why? Because think about the typical setup at an office, you're stationed at a desk, your phone, your secretary phone is on your secretary's desk. There's almost always a clock in the room And sometimes you're trained to, you know, when I used to answer the phone for my boss, one of the things he wanted to know about what time the person called, right? You know, that was included in my little note to him. So, um, I tend to believe that the secretary's time is fairly accurate. So we know that Holly is alive at 4 45 PM. We know at 6 PM, approximately 6 PM. When her friend shows up, the door is not answered. She knocks several times. So I think it's only likely to assume that she may have been lying dead in the house at 6 p.m. And that clock somehow was broke in the altercation that took place between Holly and the offender. Okay, those were some of my bonehead questions. So how about you lead us down the initial investigation? Not bonehead questions at all, Captain, because the... I will tell you what my questions are the and ti- what they're the not. Time, the time frame on this is very important, I think. And so will the investigators. So after the police are finished up at the house and everything's been cleaned up, Richard and Sean move back into the home. The police begin their investigation, interviewing the friends who had last contact with Holly. The friend who was on the phone was interviewed, but could not recall any details out of the ordinary. She states that it was just an unremarkable conversation between two teenage girls. When asked about the exact times of the call and when Holly left to answer the door, the girl was not too sure about any of these times. 
The police then interview the friend who stopped by around 6 p.m. to pick up Holly to go for pizza. Both girls could not provide any information for the police to start their investigation with. No leads from either of these, uh, the ear witness or the person that stopped by the house. We will circle back to this, Captain, I assure you of that. So the police then decide to widen their investigation. Sean, Holly's brother, and his friend Mark, well, they fall under suspicion, but very quickly their alibi checks out and was confirmed. Also, not only are there alibis, but one, it's weird that you'd ring the door and you can kind of rule out the, the father because why would the father show up? She talks to the father, then calls her father's work. Mm-hmm. Unless the father was like, makes her call, mm-hmm. right? To set up an alibi. Mm-hmm. But it just doesn't seem, you know. I mean, and and if it, and if your father did show up, you'd tell your friend on the phone, "Hey, my father's here. I gotta go." What was really weird about this, though, this is supposed to be a tight knit, safe community. There didn't seem to be a whole lot of people that were willing to help the investigation along. So her high school friends, the friends of Holly that were under the age of eighteen, their parents kind of stepped in and wouldn't allow them to be interviewed or answer questions from the police. The high school friends that were over the age of 18, a lot of times attorneys were hired and they refused to be interviewed as well. That's shady. Very shady. So the police now hit a serious dead end. Not much evidence at the scene, no fingerprints and no one to interview to provide any leads. So the police decide to request the help of the amazing Kreskin. George Kreskin is a mentalist. He is known for hypnotizing people to pull details from their memory that they could not do with normal recall. Mm -hmm. In this case, he hypnotized the friend who was on the phone with Holly when the murderer or when someone had arrived at the door. He was able to hypnotize her and have her identify the songs that were playing in the background while Holly went and answered the door. They then took this information to the local radio station, and they were able to determine the exact time that Holly answered the door. This is back in the day when there's actually DJs probably picking the song and playing the song. Right. It's probably not pre-programmed computer stuff back back in that day. Yeah, so let's see here. Let's say she was on hold for two or three minutes, maybe Mm. maybe four. So I'm guessing the way that they're determining this is the sequence of the songs that she heard. Like, okay, yes. you, I heard this, this, and then maybe the start of this song. And they take it to the station. They say, well, that occurred around 4.40 p.m. on that Wednesday, which is very interesting. And it, it's actually a very creative way to try to get this time frame because the way we're mm-hmm. reporting this, Captain, it it's not so much a mystery to you and I because we know the facts later afterwards right the initial investigation the ones that gave us the facts yeah but the initial investigation the what they get from that person on the phone yeah they don't have any times they have no times to go off of it was sometime in the afternoon Mm -hmm. i think she originally told the police that it was sometime between 4 and 5 p.m that they were on the phone and that's as much as they had right so they were able to really narrow this down instead of having a 60 minute window or even a little more beyond that, they're really able to nail this down to, Hey, at about 4 40 PM is when somebody knocked on the door. So very key piece of information to know what time that phone call took place and what time it is believed that somebody had arrived at the door. The other thing here too, captain, the investigation, what they're working with is they're seeing a scene where somebody took the time to clean the scene. Somebody took the time to wipe fingerprints off of the handle of the knife and off of other locations in the house. So police start working with a theory here that there was a very good chance that at six o'clock when Sally arrived to pick Holly up for pizza, that either the murderer was still on the scene or had just left and was in the immediate area. Right. This is why when she had that gut feeling that something was wrong, Sally may have saved herself from an encounter with the murderer. Now, with no leads, the investigation stalls. 
and Sean, her brother, started spreading rumors. On May 10th, 1980, the mayor of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, declared it Holly Brannigan Reward Fund Day. They set up a hotline for donations, and Holly's high school performed a play with the proceeds going to the reward fund. They collected over $5,000. The lack of progress in the investigation really upset her brother, Sean. He started to spread a rumor that he and the police knew who had killed Holly. Yeah, it's not a bad tactic. Well, and he also starts telling people that not only only do they know who did it, but the police were getting ready to make an arrest. Yeah. His father, Richard, warned him that this kind of talk might upset the murderer and make Sean a possible target. Uh, Sean didn't seem to care. He continued to spread these rumors to everyone that was willing to listen. That's a, kind of a weird thing for the father to say. Well, I don't think so. I think he's been a victim once he's worried about something could happen to his son right so sean is a sophomore at college and on september 9th 1979 uh, there was an explosion at the renner service station where he worked at 9 30 a.m as part of a regular cleanup routine sean and his friend mark were scrubbing the floor with two cups of gasoline to loosen the grease off of the floor The boys were scrubbing prior to using a power washer to wash away the grime. Mark walked out as a customer had pulled up to get gasoline. The doors to this area were shut when the explosion occurred inside the service station with Sean still inside. Mark ran to the doors, but the flames were too great for him to enter. He went around to the side and he found Sean climbing out of the window. Sean was still on fire and had been burned over most of his body. Mark put out the flames and comforted Sean until medical help could arrive. Sean begged Mark not to leave him during this time. The ambulance arrived and transported Sean to the hospital. He was unable to talk, but the police wanted to interview Sean about his sister's murder in case he had a deathbed confession to give. They asked Sean yes and no questions, that he responded to by moving his head. He was asked if he had killed Holly or if he knew who killed Holly. He signaled no to both questions. Sean would die from his injuries the following day. Now, Richard, his father, had lost his whole entire family. Right. An investigation into Sean's accident was conducted by the state fire marshal. It was concluded that the power washer had a faulty switch which caused an electrical arc to ignite the gasoline fumes. Richard would go to his grave believing that Sean was murdered by someone involved in Holly's death. He believed the rumor Sean was spreading made the murderer frightened enough to kill Sean. This belief was deepened in Richard's mind when the owner of the power washer was found dead under suspicious circumstances six years after Sean's death. Mm. There's a lot to unpack here. Yes. So they're working at the service station. They they claim that the there's a faulty switch and f- the electricity that would go through the faulty switch that sparked and ignited the gasoline that would be all over the floor and all over the shop. Right. And so then this guy ends up dead, the guy that owned the power washer? Correct. Okay. But, was, but how did he die? Well, let's go through that real quick, and then we can, we can circle back. Yeah, this is. there's a lot of death here. Okay, so the power washer that caused the explosion that killed Sean was borrowed from a restaurant from a business a few doors down from the Renner's service station. The owner of this place, and it's called the King Chef, lent the power washer to Renner's service station. On August 12th, 1985, Tony Soriano, the owner of the King Chef restaurant, was found dead in his car. Two people on their way to go fishing passed his car, which was still running, and discovered his body. On the initial exam, there was trauma to the back of Soriano's head. This led people to believe that he was murdered. But during the autopsy, it was discovered that Mr. Soriano had strychnine in his system. And after this discovery, the coroner ruled his death a suicide. 
adding to the rumors of explain strict nine. So it's 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 highly poisonous. Okay. If you take it, you're going to die. Okay. Don't ever take that. So strict nine. Don't take it. Right. So, th- but this is just one of these weird things here. I think this is a weird coincidence. It was his death was ruled a suicide. Mm. Okay. And Sean's death was ruled an accident. These both, both these incidents were looked into. They were looked into and they were ruled by people that, that are paid to do so. They right. have experience in this area. Right. It's, it's not like both deaths are, are labeled undetermined all these years later. And I spoke with a, uh, a firefighter regarding the, the Sean accident. And, you know, there's not, we don't have official documents to review, but what we could find, we reviewed together. And he said, look, I used to, I used to do these types of investigations. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to believe that this story isn't correct. There's nothing that points out that this is not correct. That's very likely. I mean, that's one of the reasons why they'd say, I mean, you can have static electricity off your clothes could start a huge fire in a gas station or your cell phone usage can start a fire. So a faulty switch on a power washer uh, definitely could start a fire. Well, and I tell you what, we, you know, we have so, so much experience with gas and we use it daily. I think that a lot of people take take it for granted how dangerous and how flammable some people gas have, can be. Yeah, some people have more gas than others. Well... The thing is, though, I think people forget how explosive gas can be given the right circumstances. And if this is exactly how it went down, the way we just told this, it seems almost like, I mean, forgive me for saying so, you're playing with fire here. Right. Well, also, if you're cleaning, inside, you know, they said he's inside the service station. If they're using gasoline to be cleaning things inside the service station. Then you're also having all those fumes that they're not going anywhere. Right. Those places weren't properly ventilated back in the day. No. And I would guess that, that normal protocol and procedure would be when cleaning with gas to open up and vent out the place. They may have simply just turned on this power washer too quickly, thus causing some kind of spark that ignites into this explosion. So if you have a faulty power washer or a faulty engine or any piece of electrical part of that of that power washer is faulty right you could get a spark that in a closed environment filled with gas fumes would in fact create some type of explosion now when sean was hanging out with mark is this his buddy mark that he spent the night with correct correct i mean it's kind of odd that he's hanging out with mark the day his sister is murdered and then he's hanging out with mark Yes. When he dies. No, I agree with that. It's it seems like hey, a little odd. Two coincidences in one. Unless you're hanging out with this guy every day, anyways. Right. Then. It appears that they worked together. That they worked on vehicles together. We also have witness statements of of Sean saying that Mark he wanted Mark by his side when as he was dying. It was one of those situations, man. His injuries were so bad. They knew he was going to die. They knew when we take him to the hospital, he's not going to recover from this. It's only a matter of time. So Holly and Sean's mother passes away with cancer. Holly is then murdered inside their home. Sean then dies. And what we think is an accident. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if like their father or something made a deal with the devil And that the devil's coming back to collect. Well, that's the first thing that jumps off the page to you when you look at this case. There's so much death. There's so much tragedy surrounding Richard Brannigan. And, you know, I hate to say this because my initial suspicions, they went toward Richard Brannigan. Right. Just because it seemed to me that this just seems like too much. But here's the thing. We do know that his wife died from cancer. I can't give you cancer. I can't make you get cancer. I can't make you die of cancer. Mm, That's just, that's just something that happened. Mm -hmm. That's just something that happened. And unfortunately in our lives nowadays, we know it happens to somebody we know, somebody we love. It happens in every family. It's just an unfortunate, terrible thing. So that we need to ignore that, that, that can't be part of the coincidence for us. The other thing that we need to keep in mind here, though, too, is 
her father from nothing that I could find was ever a suspect in her murder or in the investigation. The investigation never seemed to lean that way. That tells me a few things. Just like her brother, Sean, who had an airtight alibi. Right. You know, we don't have to use our imagination too much to come up with an airtight alibi for Sean. Sean's actually received more suspicion over the years than his father, Richard. But see, Sean, we know, was at his friend's house. And we know that they stayed there that night. And we know that the friend still lived with at least his mother, if not both parents. So Sean more than likely has multiple alibis for the time of his sister's death. As far as the father goes, I'm going out on a limb here, Captain, and I'm making the assumption that he has an alibi as well. And I'm doing that based off of just that he was never listed as a suspect. He was never discussed as a suspect, where we even have Sean publicly being discussed as a suspect at some point. Well, we do have a record of her calling her father's office at 445 and asking if the father's there Mm -hmm. and the father has gone on business. So you would think that whether he's driving a car, he would have had to have some rental receipt, or if he's flying on a plane, he would have the airline ticket. So those could be your airtight alibis. Well, he's going to have, as you said, receipts. This could include gas receipts. This also could include checking into a hotel somewhere. And they could be able to easily verify that, hey, if if the secretary says he left at this time, we have this gas receipt from here, and he checks into the hotel at this time, then there's very likely little possibility that he could have had the time to go out of his way, return to his home, attack and kill his daughter, and then continue on his trip. Sometimes it's just an impossibility. There's just not enough time. And I think in all fairness, we need to add in here that Holly's father, Richard, never stopped searching for her killer. It was not one of these parents that just disappeared, moved off to another city, went about his business as though nothing happened. This man was severely affected by the loss of his whole family. He was severely affected by the loss of his wife, by his daughter, and by his son. And the man continued to live in that home, in the home that Holly was murdered in, until he was very late in age. All right, thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Make sure you get your Filling Fami shirt at the discounted price of nineteen ninety nine, in honor of Fami Malik passing. And until next time, be good, be kind, and don't let it. You can live out your MasterChef dreams when you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that.